Okay, and welcome to unit number three on energy and society. Um, before we begin, uh, we should say that this unit has been divided into three topic areas. Um, the first is kind of an investigation of mechanical energy and what's involved in mechanical energy, and it really follows very nicely from the topics of kinematics and dynamics that we've been studying in unit one and two. Um, the second part of this unit is heat energy and is looking at energy that's um, that has to do with the transfer of heat. And the final part of the unit is on nuclear energy. And in Ontario, um, we group these three topics together into one large unit on, uh, on energy in society and energy's role in society. And really that's where we're going to start because um, energy and and looking for ways to go green is very, very uh, predominant, uh, both in, in media um, and in government in, in the current day. The ways we produce energy, the numerous ways that we waste energy, <clears throat> and the amount of energy that really is required to power North America um, and really develop nations around the world are very, very highly debated. And what we're going to do throughout this unit is, is really learn um, some of the topics and some of the themes that will help us to focus on um, ways in which we can discuss energy usage, energy production, um, in, in a meaningful and in, in a scholarly way. What we need to ask first is, you know, what is energy? You know, and probably textbooks define it as the ability to do work. Okay, so energy is, um, when something has energy, it has the ability to do work. And maybe even more specifically than that, energy is a scalar physical quantity that describes the amount of work that can be done by a force. Okay, so let's break down that sentence because there's lots of good stuff in here. A scalar physical quantity. Scalar refers to the fact that energy is not a vector. Okay, energy is a scalar quantity. Physical refers to the fact that it can be measured. Okay, so a scalar physical quantity that describes the amount of work that can be done by a force. Now this word work we've seen now in these two definitions and we're going to come back to that later in this lesson and really define what work is because work is very different when you look at it from maybe the way you understand it now to the way physics describes work. Energy comes in many different forms. Mechanical energy, which we've mentioned, and we're going to examine first. Thermal energy, which is also included in the grade 11 curriculum. Nuclear energy, which we'll look at at the end of the unit. And these are the main three topics of our unit. But there's lots of other types of energy. There's gravitational energy, there's electromagnetic energy, and the list could go on and on and on and on. There's all different types of energy. Mechanical, thermal, and nuclear form the basis of study for us. Others you'll learn later. Okay. Um, really, if we want to describe energy in, in kind of an, analog, an analogy sort of way, um, physics really is, is, is the study of the relationship between matter and energy, right? So matter is the stuff of the universe, and energy, you could look at it as kind of like a fuel that makes matter go and, and do things, right? So that's kind of a way of maybe conceptualizing what energy is. Um, energy is very... Uh, it's subject to a very important law of conservation. And you may have come across this maybe perhaps in science, or we've certainly heard of the conservation of mass, where mass or matter can't be created or destroyed. But energy also has a conservation law that, that energy can't be created or destroyed. It's only shifted between its, between its various forms. And we're going to consider that... Um, 
conservation of energy in, uh, in a real and meaningful way later on in this unit. Okay? But we need a place to start because all of this is hand-waving and we need to, to really pick a place to begin. And so where we're going to begin is by talking about work and what work is. The process of transferring energy from one form to another is called work. Okay? So when one thinks about how energy is transferred, there's a common element in all cases. All right? So here we have um, a division of our little page. And let's say we've got gasoline and a match. Okay, so two different forms of chemical energy and of course we know that if we were to light that match and then pop it into the gasoline of course madness would ensue and we'd have an explosion that gas can would be no more um, in another example here we have a car on an incline that's been parked incorrectly and of course um, the force of gravity is what causes this car to move down the incline at a very high speed. Okay, So gravity will accelerate this car down the hill until it's going quite fast and it can do some damage. Here we have a spring and a block and this block has compressed the spring so that we've got all this energy that's stored in the spring. And when we let that go, when we let that go, the, the spring force shoots the block off of the spring and it ends up going quite fast as well, relatively speaking. Here in a light bulb, really the electrons running through this um, cathode um, cause the um, a lot of heat to build up and so when we flick the switch of course we turn the light on and we get something that's quite hot and so what is the common element in all of these situations and of course you may be saying oh well, there's a force that's present in every single one of these situations and you would be exactly right the common element is that for work to be done a force must be applied and more specifically work is done on an object when a force moves the object through a displacement so what that means mathematically is that work is equal to some applied force times the distance or the displacement. You'll notice that the units for force are newtons and uh, for displacement we have meters. So that means that the units for work are newton meters. And again, um, we have a derived SI unit and we call a newton meter, one newton meter is a joule, is one joule. And um, that is the SI unit for energy. And we can now feel free, instead of writing Newton meters, um, we can write joules. The joule, of course, was named after James Prescott Joule. He was an English physicist, and he was also a brewer during the 1800s. Um, so he studied a lot of heat and its relationship to mechanical energy. So let's take a look at an example. Here's example one. A student exerts a force of 200 newtons, pushing a desk across a room for a displacement of 3 meters. How much work did the student do? So here's a little diagram. Student is pushing across this, this desk across the room and is pushing it for a displacement of 3.0 meters. How much work did the student do? Well, we know that the displacement is in this direction. The desk is obviously going to move across the floor. And the force is in the same direction as the displacement. 
which is good, which is a good thing. If the student pushed down on the desk, obviously the, the desk wouldn't move through this displacement. The student couldn't do much useful work, but the force and the displacement are in the same direction, which is important because we're going to come to situations where if they're not in the same direction, well, what do we do? So here is our formula for work, that the applied force times the distance is equal to the work. And we can sub in our two numbers, 200 newtons times 3 meters is 600 newton meters, which we know is 600 joules. So that's how much work the student do, did in moving this desk. Now I said before that it's kind of crucial that we've noted this force and displacement were in the same direction. Really they were parallel with each other, right? The force was applied in the same direction that the desk moved. And that's going to become very important in a few moments. So, and this, it has to do with this first, this first sentence right in here, is that you may find it interesting that work is a scalar quantity, but force and displacement are vector quantities. Okay? So, it's kind of like, oh, well, how does that work? How do we have two vectors that you'll notice we were multiplying together, or, and, and I say that with quotations around the word multiplying, how did we get a scalar from two vectors? And we're going to explain that in, in just a moment. But if you push on a car from behind to speed it up, or if you stand in front of it and push it to slow it down, you're transferring energy to the car in both cases. Work is independent of direction. Right? It doesn't matter which way um, you you apply your force, direction, direction with work doesn't matter. And this is expressed mathematically using what's known as the dot product. Right? So the dot product, all you need to know now is that it's a way of multiplying two vectors to produce a scalar. So that's when I gave you the formula for work is equal to the applied force times the displacement. It's, it's not really times, it's the, the applied force with the dot product of displacement. And basically what it means is, is that all that's important when we're considering this um, work that's being done is the component of the force that kind of acts in the same direction as the motion. Because we know that, let's say in that previous example, if we were trying to push the desk horizontally, right, we want the desk to move in a displacement that's horizontally, but we push down vertically on the desk. Well, the desk isn't going to move, which means that we've actually done no work at all. And so that's something that's very important. And really, we have a modified version of this equation. And it's that the applied force times d the displacement, times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors will give us the work that's done. And here is a little uh, diagram of the situation. We've got some applied force, and we've got the direction of motion. And of course the angle theta comes in between those two vectors. And really all that matters is the um, component of the applied force that's in the same direction as the displacement. So in other words, basically if not all of the force is exerted in the same direction as the movement, we need to find the part of the force that does act in the direction of the movement. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. A pilot pulls her wheeled suitcase behind her through the airport at an angle of 50 degrees to the horizontal. How much work <coughs> does she do to move the suitcase 540 centimeters if her applied force is 300 newtons? So here's our little diagram. This suitcase is going to move in what direction? 
It's going to move in this direction because she's pulling it behind her. But if she's pulling up on that handle as well, yeah, she's walking forward, so she's pulling the handle. The force is kind of directed at an angle. So there's a component of that force vector that's in the same direction as the displacement, but that's also perpendicular to that displacement. And so we say the force and the displacement aren't in the same direction. And so because of that, it's important that we know the angle between them. So we know that the force is 300 newtons, and we know that the displacement is 5.4 meters. We've got to turn that 540 centimeters into meters. We know that the angle is 50 degrees. So how much work is she actually doing? Well, we go to this formula and say that work is equal to force times displacement times the cosine of theta. And we can say 300 newtons times 5.4 meters times the cosine of 50. And that gives us 1,041 joules, which is how much work she does. And, you know, this is kind of the end of the lesson at this point. But this stuff um, is very, very tricky to understand. And it's especially tricky to understand if, you're, if you've just watched a video and done some examples. So I would encourage you at this point to, you know, hopefully if you're in a class where your teacher's done a whole bunch of demonstrations or you've done a couple labs um, or maybe this is just a refresher you know really you do need to see some um, examples of kind of why the dot product works the way it does and how it does there's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube also that you can check out to see some real-life examples of the dot product and the dot product at work um, uh, but if you haven't seen this, and if you're if you're kind of wrapping your head around why these concepts are not coming to you naturally, you really do need to ask either your teacher or um, uh, your professor to maybe explain um, what the dot product is, because it's really hard to learn just through examples. Anyways, good luck.